Okay, looks like it's 10 o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you, everybody, for joining us on this uh, virtual conference this morning. What an exciting uh, month it's been um, putting this conference together and uh, changing it from an in-person conference to a virtual conference. We're very excited about the next three days. We have um, about a thousand people registered for the conference from 43 states across the nation. So it's very exciting. We just want to welcome all of you um, and thank our sponsors uh, who are listed on the screen here. I have uh, just a few slides of information to share with you as we get started. This is our first uh, session for the conference. Um, a few technical uh, instructions. Audio and video are muted for all participants, but you are welcome to use the question and answer feature at the bottom of your screen to ask questions. And I will make sure that our speakers and panelists get those questions. The presentation slides are posted online on the NRTRC website. The link is shown there. And the uh, recording will also be posted online after the conference. One other thing on that session page, there is a post session survey that we'd uh, love you to fill out if you can take just a few minutes when we're done today and let us know what you thought about the session. So I'm going to turn the time over to our uh, moderator for the panel today, Aaliyah Fry. Uh, the presenters are, are listed here on this screen, but I believe Aaliyah is going to do a little bit more introduction to each of them. So I will stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Aaliyah. Aliyah, can you unmute your microphone, please? Thank you for that. Good morning. My name is Sharon Turner, and I am the Regional Administrator for HRSA's Office of Regional Operations. Um, we are pleased to bring to you the Region 10 State of the Region. Um, this panel that you are about to hear will share telehealth regional programs and as well as HHS and Region 10 will provide updates and resources related to telehealth. And again, welcome, and we are excited to present today. Thank you. As, as I mentioned, um, we hope this panel will provide insight into regional telehealth activities, increase awareness of HHS, HRSA telehealth programs and resources, and provide an opportunity for you, the audience, to ask questions of our panel experts. This event supports the HRSA mission to improve health outcomes and to address health disparities through access to quality services, a skilled health workforce, and innovative high-value programs. This event further aligns with the Health and Human Services strategic objective to strengthen the healthcare workforce to meet America's diverse needs through supporting the use of telehealth solutions to increase access and improve quality of care in rural and underserved areas. Now, we've created a dynamic panel for you today. Um, we will start with an overview of the webinar objectives which will be to, um, okay, thank you. I should be telling Aaliyah next slide. Um, so we will start with the uh, overview of the webinar objectives. Following this, we will have opening remarks by our HHS um, regional director, Mr. John R. Graham. And next, the state of the region panel will feature program managers and administrators from state and regional rural health organizations 
followed by a Q&A. After that, we will have the regional administrators from the administration from children and families, um, administration for community living, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, HRSA, as well as SAMHSA, will provide Region 10 telehealth resource and program updates, which we will also have an opportunity for Q&A. Next slide. So the learning objectives, um, we hope that by the end of this session, you will feel that you have increased your knowledge and awareness of rural health challenges and barriers including accessing and utilizing telehealth resources, telehealth assessments and findings, and become more familiar with HHS and HRSA programs and resources. Next slide. So I would like to introduce to you our HHS Region 10 Regional Director, Mr. John R. Graham. John R. Graham was appointed the Regional Director for Region 10 on April 1, 2018. He previously served as the Acting Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation during the administration's first year. He has almost two decades of experience as a financial, economic, and policy analyst in the health sector. Working at a number of well-known nonprofit research institutes, uh, Mr. Graham has led research on topics including payment reform, regulation of drugs and medical devices, health information technology, and comparing international health systems. His short articles on health policy have appeared in the media, including the Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, and Forbes, where he contributed a regular column until joining the administration in 2017. Regional Director John R. Graham, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. And thank you for reading the biographical note my mother composed for me. Thank you. Very much. Uh, I'm so grateful uh, for the NRTRC and for Telehealth Oregon for uh, pivoting quickly and getting us uh, to do this virtual meeting. Um, uh, this is the second virtual meeting uh, that I've had this week. And uh, I have yet, I've been watching very carefully, I have not seen a cat or a dog or a spouse or a child walk behind anybody or on a keyboard. So we're ahead of the game. And hopefully over the next three days, we'll, 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 we'll maintain the high quality we've, we've had so far. Well, welcome everybody. And, and thank you again on behalf of Secretary Alex Azar. Uh, it's so great to be able to get a panel of all of our optive leaders and experts uh, you've done something I can, I can very seldom do. It's very uh, difficult for me to get these folks together. So I'm really looking forward uh, to, to learning what everyone's going to share. Uh, I'll just take a few minutes before we get the panel kicked off. Um, Secretary Azar and all of our leaders in the department are very excited about telehealth and telehuman services. We have been uh, pushing the envelope uh, on rulemaking and flexibilities Across our, across our operating divisions. And we are unfortunately in the middle of a natural experiment that is giving us even more flexibility. You've seen over the last few weeks in response to the COVID-19 emergency, uh, even greater flexibilities in telehealth and telehuman services. Uh, and we think this is a very important component of our response to the COVID-19 emergency. And when we move towards the next phase of response and recovery, uh, we will see, hopefully, we will learn uh, that many of the flexibilities we're using uh, in response to the emergency, uh, we will learn that they are going to be effective in a non-emergency phase, and it will give us evidence that we can even push the envelope farther in expanding the use of telehealth and telehuman services. Outside the COVID-19 emergency, we think telehealth uh, is very important in value-based reform, uh, and uh, we are going to continue that push once we're done here. And we're also, I'm so glad we got SAMHSA is going to be speaking uh, because we are very aware that in this uh, COVID-19 response uh, that the folks who are seeking diagnosis, treatment, or recovery from opioid use disorder or other substance use disorder, uh, now that we're not able to be physically proximate to each other, they face special challenges uh, and we're not ignoring them. We're very focused on their needs. Uh, so on that, I will, I will yield the floor. I'm, I'm looking forward to our HHS panel of experts, and I'm also looking forward to 
uh, the other speakers over the next three days. One of the things I've followed is uh, you know, the fundraising in the private sector of the telehealth companies is remarkable and some of the uptake of telehealth services I've seen, uh, some of the announcements in the markets is, is quite remarkable. So we're seeing a real shift in, in the use of telehealth and telehuman services and uh, I'm looking forward to learning from everyone who's, who's going to be speaking at this conference over the next three days. Thank you. Thank you, Regional Director Graham, for your remarks. We are so pleased that you could share with us today. We will now go into our State of the Region panel to hear the state-level perspective on telehealth activities within the region. We will first hear from Mary Sheridan. Mary Sheridan, RN, MBA, is the Bureau Chief and the Bureau of, of the Bureau of Rural Health and Primary Care, Division of Public Health, Idaho Department of Health and Welfare since 2003. She is passionate about understanding rural health issues and seeking resources to help address unmet needs. Mary is honored to recently serve on the National Advisory Committee on Rural Health and Human Services. The committee advises the Secretary of Health and Human Services on strategies to address health issues in rural areas. Mary is the past president of the National Organization of State Offices of Rural Health and continues to serve on the board. Ms. Sheridan, the floor is yours. Ms. Sheridan, I think we're having difficulty hearing you. If you could be sure that you are unmuted. I'm unmuted. Do you have my slides? There we go. All right. Great. All right. Thank you so much um, and good morning. The Idaho Bureau of Rural Health and Primary Care is located in the Division of Public Health in the Idaho Department of Health and Welfare. Our offices are located in Boise. And um, we house the State Office of Rural Health, and we also have the Medicare Rural Hospital Flexibility Program, the Small Rural Hospital Improvement Program, uh, and the Primary Care Office. And our PCO is responsible for the J-1 Visa Waiver Program, our shortage area designations, uh, and National Health Service Corps Technical Assistance. Uh, we also have two loan repayment programs for clinicians working in underserved areas. Uh, and it's my pleasure to meet with you today and share uh, with you a bit about Idaho's telehealth experiences. Next slide, please. Idaho does not currently have an alliance or a coordinating body to support telehealth in Idaho. So what I will share with you is a bit about our past experiences and our lessons learned during our CMMI SIM, which is the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation State Innovation Model, as well as some of the current efforts that we have underway that are supported and aligned with our value-based healthcare initiatives. Next slide, please. In 2014, Idaho established the Idaho Telehealth Council to define telehealth and the parameters under which telehealth services can be delivered in Idaho. The council created a set of recommendations that resulted in the Idaho Telehealth Access Act, which is found in Idaho code. And the act essentially provides the guardrails under which telehealth services can be delivered in the state. Currently, the act requires the use of two-way audio and visual communications to establish a new patient relationship. Uh, the act also requires that the Idaho community standard of care must be satisfied. During our most recent legislative session, the language in the statute was modified to include the use of two-way audio or audio-visual communication to establish a new patient relationship. So uh, that will be a change for us. 
the governor has signed the legislation in March of 2020, so the new requirements will become effective on July the 1st uh, this year. The Idaho Telehealth Council completed its work in 2015 with the development of the Access Act and no longer exists. Idaho received a four-year SIM, and again, that State Innovation Model Award from CMMI beginning in January of 2015, and we included a number of telehealth initiatives. We provided grants to 12 patient-centered medical home clinics to support the development or expansion of their telehealth programs. And we also had a contractor. We hired health management associates to provide the tools needed for clinics to establish telehealth programs. These were things such as uh, how to conduct a readiness assessment, how to conduct a demand analysis, and strategies for proper equipment selection. Our contractor also provided extensive one-on-one -on -one technical assistance to our 12 grantees, and this included traveling on site to their clinics and monthly calls with them to provide education, to respond to questions, and to help troubleshoot issues. Um, I would say this is one of the things that we did during that SIM grant that was hugely successful, um, that was very much appreciated. Uh, clinics found it very valuable and a truly important resource for them to help them develop their programs. I would say, in general, some of our biggest challenges include a really very complex and varied reimbursement environment. Idaho does not have telehealth payment parity, and this makes the successful development and implementation and sustainability of telehealth programs extremely difficult, I think especially in our rural and very under-resourced communities. As I mentioned earlier, Idaho does not have a statewide coordinating body or an association to support broader statewide telehealth efforts or to coordinate advancement of telehealth on a state level. Uh, we also lack resources to provide training or the resources needed to address workflow processes at the clinic level. And we have also found some challenges with uh, coordination that can occur if uh, telehealth is delivered via third-party telehealth providers, if there is no linkage with the patient's primary care clinic or a patient center medical home. Next slide, please. In January of 2020, we established the Telehealth Task Force to support our value-based healthcare initiatives. And um, this I would say historically some of this really started, but really we um, gained a lot of traction in advancing telehealth following a value-based healthcare forum that we conducted in partnership with Boise State University and the Blue Cross of Idaho Foundation in October of 2019. The telehealth task force is meeting monthly for about six to seven months to create a set of recommendations to advance telehealth in Idaho. And this task force is structured a bit differently from some of the prior planning work that we have done. And that is that the majority of our members are business leaders with self-insured plans. Each month, we have a variety of subject matter experts share their telehealth experiences, their challenges, and what they see as opportunities with the task force. And we also ask them very specifically for their perspectives on what needs to happen in Idaho to advance telehealth. The task force is time limited and they will complete their work later this summer. The final report of recommendations will be shared with the Healthcare Transformation Council of Idaho, with the Idaho Health Quality Planning Commission, and with department leadership. Uh, secondly, we have also secured a telehealth a contractor to conduct a statewide environmental scan, and this is to support the work of the task force. And this environmental scan includes a literature review, a statewide survey of providers, and key informant interviews with clinicians, stakeholders, and association leaders. And this work is currently underway. Regarding COVID-19, we have definitely fielded quite a number of calls from rural health clinics that are seeking information and support 
to establish new telehealth programs since they can currently serve as distant sites. I would say that Idaho Medicaid is leading the way regarding current expansion of telehealth opportunities during the pandemic. And we are also receiving anecdotal information that telehealth utilization is increasing during the pandemic due to the new opportunities that have been created by policy changes, but also to help ensure the delivery of services while assuring the safety and the health of their patients. Uh, that is all that I had. Thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate the opportunity to share with you a bit about Idaho's efforts. Thank you, Ms. Sheridan, for your presentation. Next, we will hear from Rose Locklear. Rose Locklear joined the Oregon Office of Rural Health in 2017 after completing two inter internships at the Oregon Office of Rural Health as a part of her master's degree in public health at Oregon State University. She began as a program coordinator at ORH to help Oregon's rural and frontier critical access hospitals increase access and provide support to providers through telehealth programming and Project ECHO. The initial focus of this work was to assess hospitals' health information technology and providers' training and support needs. Rose currently oversees ORH's annual forum on aging, as well as the Rural and Frontier Listening Tour. She also serves on state and regional telehealth and Project ECHO governing boards. Rose holds master's degrees in public health and kinesiology from Oregon State University and is based in Central Oregon. Ms. Locklear, the floor is yours. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, I am a field services program manager at the Oregon Office of Rural Health, and as Lilia previously mentioned, uh, my current, my, my previous role was with regard to um, conducting, creating and conducting telehealth assessments at our critical access hospitals, and ironically, this came about from a Rural and Frontier listening tour, which is now a program area that I oversee, and um, next, next slide, please. So today I will get into briefly a bit about what telehealth and behavioral health data we have at the Oregon Office of Rural Health, a bit about best practices for delivering health, telehealth in a, in a rural setting, as well as key considerations and recommendations for telehealth implementation. Next slide, please. So as I uh, alluded to, we have two, I'm going to be sharing two different data points here. So the first one is a telehealth repository that really maps out all of the telehealth services that our critical access hospitals in the state of Oregon are offering. So this is uh, the platform that's used to house all this information is called a story map created by ArcGIS. And what it allows you to do is to have a map on the right side, which is showing up here, and on the left side, a bit of text, and that's describing all the different services. The left side describes the different services of the critical access hospitals. This is one example of one of our independent hospitals. And on the right side, the, the blue um, icon indicates the hospital, and the black pins indicate the partnering institutions that the hospital partners with to increase access to various services. So we see a couple of different things when we, when we um, take a look at our independence versus system hospitals. The independent hospitals are largely foraging partnerships with surrounding hospitals and clinics. And this is a prime example of an independent hospital on the side of a border state. And they're utilizing hospitals within Oregon as well as clinics and hospitals outside of Oregon in order to, to um, have the services that you see over to the right here, the telestroke, cardiology, neurology, oncology. All the tabs along the top of the uh, resource here are indicative of different hospitals, critical access hospitals across the state. And again, we're going to show you the relationships. The systems, what we see in our system critical access hospitals, that they tend to band together with their larger 
mothership hospital in order to provide those services. So it's a really neat representation of what's going on in the state and it allows us to keep, um, keep our finger on the pulse of the different services and telehealth uh, expansion that's going on at the critical access hospitals. With regards to telebehavioral health, which was a question um, with regard to this panel, in the hospital setting, really, we've got 17 critical access hospitals that are doing telehealth um, in, this, in uh, this repository, and only seven of them are doing telebehavioral health sorts of things. In the hospital setting, we're seeing services more like almost nearly all of them are doing um, telestroke and more emergency department sort of things, as you can see this one. Um, next slide, please. So in addition to the repository, and that's really putting the chicken before the egg or what, what came first and what I was originally hired to do as the telehealth coordinator was to create a readiness assessment. And we did that um, in tandem with subject matter experts. So it was a project echo as well as a telehealth assessment. And that was uh, we contracted with uh, the Telehealth Alliance of Oregon in, in Oregon. We were very fortunate to have subject matter experts and organizations that do a lot of work with regard to policy and um, keeping up with all the different policy recommendations and, and changes that were occurring prior to COVID. <laughs> and that's a whole different story than where we're at now. Um, but really, we worked with subject matter experts from Project ECHO and from, and from the Telehealth Alliance of Oregon to create an, an assessment that looked at really these three buckets for hospitals. We wanted to bring together um, did various different data resources and present, um, present some information that hospitals could use in the event that they were in interested in telehealth um, implementation. And um, the whole goal with the telehealth assessments were to save time from the hospital staff. As you well know, if you work with critical access hospitals or work rural facilities, often leadership wear multiple hats and taking on uh, a telehealth assessment is often um, a quite a timely pursuit. The other, um, there were really two components to this assessment. So we, um, I'll get into the different data pieces here momentarily, but what we ultimately did was um, on our end pulled various different data sources to create the community profile and the service area data and community health needs assessment priorities, and then did survey of leadership and providers. Now, we compiled all that information into a report so it was easily accessible by clinics if they did decide to pursue other funding opportunities such as USDA or various other opportunities out there to support telehealth implementation. Um, and in the next couple of slides, I'll get into uh, the different components of that assessment to give you bit of a background and um, visual representation. So in addition to the report that the hospitals that participated ultimately got, we as a team of the subject matter experts, myself, as well as the field services program director at the time, we also went out to the facilities and did a, um, a, a physical tour of the facility and presented our findings to them. And then ultimately the report was the final piece of of the assessment. Next slide, please. So uh, this got a little bit distorted, but as I mentioned, um, we did that facility profile um, and what we wanted to do was um, quickly provide a snapshot of the hospital where they were at in that, that time, that moment in time and uh, key important things to bring to the table for them as a representation of their, their facility as a whole. So outlining services, who they're affiliated with, um, their reimbursement structure, all important components that play into the larger picture of uh, telehealth 
service implementation. Um, we also used payment um, uh, financial data, a couple of different financial snapshots to um, look at their payer mix. Next slide, please. And as I previously mentioned, we did a, an analysis of their, their service area at the Oregon Office of Rural Health. We were very fortunate to have a pretty robust data um, database and we're able to take zip code zip codes and port them into our database and then get a snapshot of um, more causes of mortality population that's at or below the federal poverty line um, things like chronic disease and um, eligibility for Medicare and Medicaid. So what we wanted to do was provide a, a representation of the community at large for which the hospitals were serving. And we took that from, again, that service area data that our office compiles, as well as in com the community health needs assessment. So representation of what the community was really saying or things that were most important community concerns that were identified in their community health needs assessment. And then things like what they believed um, could be done to improve access to care. So I tried to remove some of the identifiable data here, just but wanted to give you all um, an illustration of really what we were presenting back to hospital leadership and the kind of data that we pulled into this assessment in order to provide um, the most comprehensive illustration of community needs um, in addition to hospital needs. So really a comprehensive picture of uh, where the hospital's at, where the community's at, and what may be the best services that, or the most um, um, highest need services from the community perspective as well as the hospital's perspective. Next slide, please. Um, so as I mentioned, we, uh, we pulled some data from the community, we pulled data from our sources and then we also did an assessment of um, interest across leadership and providers since we were asking about um, the project echo piece the continuing education we we wanted to reach out to our, to the provider group to really see what they were interested in education wise what they were interested in providing telehealth wise uh, for inpatient or for outpatient services what they really thought that the need was and um, and then also what providers and leadership felt that where they felt that the access was really lacking and what our intention behind the the survey of leaders and providers was really to show an alignment and then so to make suggestions based upon um, areas areas of alignment and so that's what this slide here is is intending to show so we asked providers and leaders we gave them this whole list of um, uh, of specialty areas, so areas that they may be interested in for educational purposes or telehealth or simply just there's a complete lack of access in the community to those particular things. Um, there were certainly varying different levels of, of, um, uh, of interest and of alignment between providers and leaders, and I think that that was a really important thing to be able to speak to. One thing that we did realize from doing this was that there are, um, that when you are, are doing an assessment of a small clinic or a hospital, your leadership and your providers is gonna give you a really small N. So perhaps um, you take this with a, a grain of salt as far as um, alignment goes and, and things like that. Next slide, please. All right, so finally, um, the recommendations that our office has. Um, I think the really important things, and when we were designing the assessment, a big piece of it was to really pull in the subject matter experts in the field. So uh, we did this from our Telehealth Alliance in Oregon, as well as subject matter expert from um, the Oregon Echo Network, which houses Project Echo in our state. Then there's also, a, when we were creating this assessment, we used various toolkits and, and assessments that were out there to really pull different pieces of them when creating ours. Um, 
So then, then, and then of course, the state offices of rural health. We we're fortunate in 2017 to um, have myself just 100% um, full time FTE to be able to do, create, and work on this telehealth assessment. And um, we also, you know, state offices of rural health are, are great offices resources when it comes to grant writing and technical assistance for things related to telehealth if you have that kind of uh, bandwidth even uh, issues even things like uh, data just for for facilities that are, are wanting to implement telehealth and then of course connected uh, center for connected health policy did they do an amazing job of keeping uh, policy up to date and telehealth conferences such as these whenever somebody reaches out to me and wants more information or, or how to, where to start. If, if there's an opportunity like this, this is a really, really good place to start. Um, in light of COVID-19, we weren't there, prior to COVID-19, there wasn't a whole lot of um, outreach to our office, specifically requesting telehealth information. We, I, the first resource that I showed you was really that, that data that, resource, the repository that houses all the, the services and whatnot that are offered at critical access hospitals. We actually built that data resource after doing a couple of telehealth assessments. And as um, I'm sure many folks that work in state offices of rural health are aware and have experienced just because um, telehealth is um, hot at one point in time, we, like I said, it kind of came about that folks did want an assessment or to really a readiness assessment of their facility to be in auction in 2015-16. By the time we got around to doing the telehealth assessments in 2017, it wasn't necessarily a top strategic priority for hospitals. So that's really what led us to create that repository to, to be able to show folks what was going on in our communities. So really, it, the, the telehealth um, the telehealth environment is changes from time to time as far as priority is, and COVID is a really prime example of that. Um, if you can bring up the, the link there, I'll, I'll just show that resource really quickly. So in light of COVID-19, we were experiencing um, rapid policy changes at the state and the federal level. I'm not seeing the resource. Okay, there we go. So <laughs> massive policy changes as, as everybody can attest to. And um, I wanted to compile all of this information in a way that was easily accessible by hospitals and clinics. And as you can see, hospitals are kind of have some stake in the game and they've already been exposed and, and are utilizing telehealth. And that's what the map here to the right shows is again, our critical access hospitals and the services that they're offering. It links back to the re repository that I previously shown. But it's really important for new adopters to be able to access this information in a linear sort of fluid type of way. So um, my idea here was to kind of present the big important pictures, the definitions of telehealth, telemedicine, and as you all know, these change our definitions are different by state and different for payers. So um, starting starting from the from the basics here, and then we had major pieces of legislation with the CARES Act, and then um, Oregon's 1135 waiver. And so I just pulled out the key points that if you were looking through and trying to collect and understand telehealth in 15 minutes, <laughs> I threw it all in here. And uh, like I said, went from a, a federal to a state Le, uh, big picture level and then got into at, at our state level the OHP temporary administrative orders tab there is really going through each temporary administrative order that Oregon has has um, created quick a quick description um, the 
the Oregon Health Authority website populates the right side here so folks can see exactly where to um, access these ad temporary administrative orders. If you want to quickly scroll through the left side, you can get a description of it and figure out whether or not it, it really pertains to you. Payment resources, again, I've, I organized at the state level to begin with uh, of the memos that accompany, accompany those temporary administrative orders that have a lot of the codes and things like that for folks to really figure out how to get paid for the services that they're they're now implementing resources web page startup guides there's all sorts of webinars and uh tutorials toolkits how to's and um, that's really what's outlined in that last tab there so um that is uh, pretty much pretty much what we're doing at the state office of um rural health here here in this in the state of oregon to keep our finger on the pulse of, of telehealth with uh, our critical access hospitals and then to provide some information in light of the um current current state of of affairs that we call covid19 thank you so much Thank you so much, Ms. Locklear, for your presentation. Next, we will hear from Tammy Arndt. Tammy Arndt is the Director of the Northwest, Tele Director of Northwest Telehealth, a regional video conference network, providing a platform of connectivity to 33 communities in Eastern Washington and Northern Idaho. Utilizing collaborative tools and established protocols, Northwest Telehealth facilitates and supports healthcare administration, distance education, and clinical services to improve access to healthcare and promote healthy communities. With over 20 years experience in the healthcare industry, Tammy has a pragmatic approach to project program development and delivery. Focusing on workflow integration of virtual services, she has facilitated the successful launch of multiple telemedicine programs, extending care to rural hospitals, clinics, and patients' homes. Tammy is proud to represent Northwest Telehealth, a founding organization of the NRTRC in Eastern Washington on the advisory board. Ms. Arndt, the floor is yours. Thank you, Aaliyah, and good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the virtual conference. I'm picturing many people out there at home in their slippers uh, enjoying the program. So um, again, I appreciate this opportunity, especially in this crazy time to uh, continue this uh, important work and host this um, conference virtually. So again, my name is Tammy Art. I'm the director of Northwest Telehealth, which is a division of Inland Northwest Health Services and affiliate of Providence St. Joseph Health. It's kind of a mouthful. So we were established in 2006 as a regional video conference network in Eastern Washington. Northwest Telehealth connects critical access hospitals and clinics to tertiary care centers like Providence Sacred Heart Medical Center in Spokane. We provide a collaborative platform for healthcare administration, medical education, and clinical programs such as ambulatory and direct-to-patient telemedicine services. As a member of Providence Healthcare here in Spokane, we also provide conference services and support to their affiliates within the Washington, Montana region. So primarily most of our activity is um, east of the Cascades, uh, but then you also have to realize that that's probably the most rural part of the state. So next slide, Aaliyah. So the counties we serve have varied geography and demographics, but are alike in rurality and the challenges faced by their residents. 14 of our rural health systems located in nine Eastern Washington counties are members of the Northwest Rural Health Network, formed for the purposes of sharing resources, promoting operational efficiencies, and improving health care services for member health systems uh, and the rural communities they serve. The network is proposing the development of a telehealth collaborative in 2020 to promote the sharing of specialists between member organizations using a standardized telehealth framework that will leverage existing resources and simplify the process of implementing new services. The telehealth collaborative will develop a model where patients can receive specialty care and associated services in their home communities with revenue from all the services staying within the rural communities around the region. This will not only serve to improve access to care for patients, but also to strengthen the rural health system as a whole. Northwest Telehealth, as a, part, a program partner, will provide technology, training, and support for the project. 
This past year, a survey of network members identified cardiology, nephrology, and infectious disease as their area of greatest need, and this was even prior to the onset of COVID. This past year, we piloted this model leveraging an endocrinologist and general surgeon at Cooley Medical Center, extending their services to neighboring hospitals in Republic and Odessa, utilizing a monthly virtual clinic to deliver scheduled consults between the participating hospitals. The success of this program has really gained uh, speed within this uh, network, and they're very interested in um, developing the system to see if they can really improve services within the communities. Next slide. So again, the service we provide includes technical assessment and program development for distance education, healthcare administration, and telemedicine services. We provide video conference solutions for conference rooms, uh, classrooms, and exam rooms, both physical and virtual. We deliver programming on behalf of members within the network, but then we also uh, connect to clinical education programs outside of the network. So for example, uh, clinicians at Sacred Heart Medical Center can attend programs or um, things that are going on at Seattle Children's or Virginia Mason. And then we also uh, kind of unique uh, to our uh, network, we have a network operations center, which is available Monday through Friday from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. for live support of programs hosted on the network. This is uh, proven to be a valuable tool as people um, come and go in and out of telehealth and the services that we do. And it really allows uh, us to develop a good relationship with our member uh, customers. Next slide. So this is just a quick glance of regional telemedicine programs uh, offered within the Washington uh, region. I pretty much, some of the data that I've put together is from Providence St. Joseph Health, uh, since we are um, one of their affiliates. And although we're an independent company, um, we kind of sit on the edge of the services that they provide. So Providence St. Joseph Health does it, uh, offer acute services within the region, stroke hospitalist and psych services. There are a multitude of ambulatory programs supporting 53 distinct telemedicine service lines. So examples would be behavioral health, cardiology, cystic fibrosis, movement disorder, oncology, and occupational medicine, just to name a few. Of note in 2019 was implementation of an urgent care psych triage program in Spokane. This was an on-demand telehealth service which connected experienced mental health professionals located at the hospital to the Providence Urgent Care Centers in town to conduct mental health risk assessments for patients experiencing severe depression, extreme anxiety, uh, or suicidal ideation. Prior to the program, these patients were referred to the emergency department and spent an average of eight hours waiting to be assessed, with more than 70% of them being discharged immediately after the assessment with outpatient resource information. The program has been very successful, increasing efficiencies, but also decreasing the overall cost of care for the patient, their insurance carrier, and the hospital. Part of this has been an important um, learning curve as well, because in today's world and the impact of the ED with COVID and testing and all of those things, it, it was nice to be able to have an established program where specialists from an ED could uh, extend their reach into other areas. In terms of consumer-based or direct-to-patient services, of course, there's a multitude of online um, services from Providence, Zoom Care, University of Washington, and MultiCare, which allows patients to access care via video for low acuity concerns from home. Specifically in response to COVID and the pandemic, Providence St. Joseph Health, who has a system-wise telemedicine team, really ramped up uh, their ability to respond. So they deployed an additional 300 car in-touch carts throughout um, the enterprise or system to provide hospitalists, ICU, and ED services. They, within a month, transitioned 7,000 Providence Medical Group providers to Zoom, utilizing Epic and, and the MyChart patient uh, portal, which was resulting in approximately 5,000 consults per day across the healthcare system. They also deployed remote patient monitoring to 700 patients utilizing digital stethoscopes and pulse oximeters. So their ability to really respond and shift their care from uh, clinic-based into a virtual world 
um, was, you know, I, I want to say relatively seamless, but that's funny to say because nothing in the land of telehealth is really relatively seamless. Um, the, the good news is that they had been um, providing virtual care already through their uh, patient portal for approximately the last, for prior 15 months to COVID. So they were pretty um, used to how the system would work and ramping it up. Next slide, please. So I wanted to also mention the Washington Rural Palliative Care Initiative. This initiative is sponsored by the Washington Office of Rural Health, Amera Group, Cambia Foundation, and Stratus Health, Health in a public and private partnership of over 24 different organizations across the state. Palliative care focuses on quality of life, symptom management, and whole person healing rather than the cure. Patients at any age can receive palliative care at any stage of serious illness or condition. So the goal of the initiative is to support Washington rural communities to build or enhance the capability to serve people with serious illness and their loved ones. The vision is for local healthcare teams to be able to provide palliative care with access to specialty consultation via telemedicine when needed. So I've been involved in this um, initiative for the last couple of years and pretty soon uh, after we started, uh, we developed a monthly case cons consultation. So currently uh, the monthly case consultation, which occurs via video, is presented by a cohort of rural hospitals uh, to a, multi a multidisciplinary team consisting of a palliative care physicians, pharmacists, nurse coordinators, social worker, and spiritual care advisors. The fun part about this is that this multidisciplinary team uh, is located across the state and comes in via video where the local care teams are each at their hospital meeting together. So it's really uh, created a, an amazing collaborative uh, and a mentorship relationship, which has helped the local teams gain the skills and confidence to support palliative care uh, and, and the patients within their communities. So we are currently developing a, a telemedicine pilot to extend the care teams into homes and then to also connect back with these specialists uh, for consultation when needed. This year we will also uh, see the implementation of cohort two. Uh, there are 11 uh, additional applications uh, from rural uh, healthcare facilities, both in Western and Eastern Washington, as well as private practice. So this is amazing work uh, where the initiative is really starting to take hold and we're really starting to see a value for this important service across the state. Next slide, please. So thanks to the efforts of Was the Washington State Telehealth Collaborative and Senator Becker, we now have both service and payment parity in Washington State. This is huge. I've been around telehealth for uh, many, many years, and it seemed like Washington State was behind forever and ever, and we weren't really uh, jumping on the bandwagon. And I think within the last five years, we've just become a uh, real leader. So I'm super proud of the efforts of so many organizations to move telehealth forward in our state. So legislation was passed in March. This was Bill 5385, which mandates reimbursement through telemedicine at the same rate as if the healthcare service was provided in person by a provider. Um, Hospitalist hospital systems, telemedicine companies and provider groups consisting of 11 or more providers may elect to negotiate a reimbursement rate for telemedicine services that differ from the reimbursement rate uh, for person for in-person services. But um, this bill for the payment parity was scheduled to uh, be signed and go into enactment in 2021, but because of COVID was signed and put into uh, play right now, which is super exciting for uh, those of us who are in Washington. Um, we also have interstate medical licensure and physical therapy compacts uh, within neighboring states, so that is helpful. And currently there is no urban or rural distinction uh, uh, for the origination sites or where the patients are located. We are optimistic that the CMS rules uh, post-COVID will expand services, uh, expand the provider types, and the locations where patients can receive services to a better address the needs of both the patients and the providers. It's so important right now in terms of COVID, but not knowing how long things will uh, remain um, with the social distancing uh, aspects. I think that uh, the future of how we deliver care is really going to uh, change as a result of this pandemic. Next slide. 
So Northwest Telehealth members in Eastern Washington have a long history of collaboration. In addition to sharing common interests and challenges related to serving rural populations, most members also refer patients needing more advanced care to a common referral center in Spokane, which is the largest concentration of healthcare services in the northern states east of Seattle and west of Minneapolis. Because of the common referral patterns, members work together routinely to address issues such as emergency medical transportation and quality improvement related to patient stabilization and transport. They also work on regional initiatives focused on health information exchange and care coordination, and then also work on planning committees for testing new programs and collecting data for evaluation. Our rural healthcare partners have learned to collaborate and improvise uh, to ensure that patients, no matter where they reside in Washington State, live on the corner of healthy and happy. So I appreciate your time and uh, listening, and I'll send it back to Aaliyah. Thank you so much, Ms. Arndt, for your presentation. Next, we will hear from Matt McCulloch. Mr. McCulloch recently became the new Associate Director of the Utah Telehealth Network, where he's responsible for UTN operations, strategic planning, and development of new services and sites for UTN. Previous to this role, he worked at the Utah Department of Health, where he was the Director of the Utah Office of Primary Care and Rural Health. He also worked in local government at the City of Farmington, Utah, where he was the GIS and IT Administrator for over nine years. He is currently a PhD candidate at the University of Utah, where he's finishing up a, doc a doctorate degree in medical geography. His research interests are in type 1 diabetes, access to care, and spatial statistics. He lives in Layton, Utah with his wife and their five children, and he enjoys landscape photography and the outdoors, including hiking, camping, and skiing. Mr. McCullough, the floor is yours. Okay, great. Thank you, Leah. Um, this is really exciting. Um, as Leah mentioned, uh, I've been the director of the Utah State Office of Rural Health for the last uh, four years, and I uh, was really interested in telehealth and what our hospitals were doing, and I felt like telehealth was going to take off and, and have a, a big impact um, in the way we deliver care in the future. Uh, so I, I made that uh, job change in February of this year, and then March of this year came, and uh, everything I thought about telehealth came a lot faster than I expected it to. But it's fun to be right in the middle of everything that's happening um, and seeing telehealth be utilized so extensively. So for my uh, presentation today, I am going to be focusing on the Northwest Regional Telehealth Resource Center and some of the things that we're doing right now, especially with uh, this pandemic of COVID-19 and what our role is in providing technical assistance to these seven states you see on the screen here. Um, I feel right at home because there have been a lot of great maps presented already. Um, and I get excited when I see maps related to hospitals and clinics and access to health care. Um, if, you, if you didn't know there was such a program in medical geography, uh, email me and, and I can tell you about it sometime. Um, all right, let's go to the next slide. So as a telehealth resource center, um, our purpose is to assist healthcare organizations and providers in implementing cost-effective telehealth programs uh, to serve rural and medically underserved populations. We also focus on providing customized technical assistance and training and support regarding telehealth and all of its broad aspects, including um, payment, reimbursement, uh, technology, legal and regulatory issues, um, e even clinical workflow and things like that. So um, we are funded uh, by the Office for the Advancement of Telehealth, uh, which is part of the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy. 
um, in the in the Health Resources and Services Administration. Um, next slide. So I wanted to uh, share kind of the landscape of telehealth resource centers nationally. There are um, 12 regional resource centers and two national resource centers. Um, you can see the Northwest Regional Telehealth Resource Center um, and the seven states that we cover, um, Utah being kind of split between the Southwest uh, Telehealth Resource Center and the NRTRC. Um, but it's great to be part of this um, community of resource centers. Uh, all of these resource centers are very active in serving the states that they cover. And they're also very good at communicating and sharing resources with one another. And um, I just want to encourage you, if you live in one of these states, if you don't know about your telehealth resource center, to reach out to them and see what resources they have and how, how they can be of help. Mr. McCulloch, I think we might be having some difficulties hearing you. I'm not sure if you are on mute or having some connectivity issues. No, he may have disconnected. His uh, his microphone is still active, but uh... but you can't hear me. Oh, there we got you. You got me. Okay. Yep. All Good right. Back. I will keep going. Can we go to the next slide? So I just have a few slides really quickly about some of the things that the NRTRC is doing to respond to COVID nineteen. A few weeks ago, uh, the, the National Consortium of Telehealth Resource Centers hosted a webinar and there were over 5,000 uh, participants nationally, which really showed the, the need for uh, technical assistance for starting up a telehealth program and being able to understand um, the challenges with policy and reimbursement and all those aspects that I mentioned. So we're all, we're all working together to provide technical assistance. Um, being new to this group, I've heard that the, the number of requests for technical assistance in the month of March um, has been equal to six months to 12 months of, of normal workload. Um, and, but all of these resources are online. The, this recorded webinar is also online. Um, Okay, next slide. Um, so this is specific to the state of Utah, but um, we felt like sharing it because um, it, it may be generalizable to the, the region. We helped the Utah Department of Health perform a telehealth assessment, specifically in regards to COVID-19. We did this in early March of this year. We had about 200 respondents from um, providers, clinics, hospitals, healthcare systems, payers, and found that only about 40% uh, were using telehealth for their patients. And even less, about 22% were, were using it to treat COVID-19, to triage and, and um, um, meet with patients who may be experiencing symptoms similar to COVID-19. Um, the other two really important things that we learned from this survey were uh, first that 61% did not have the capacity to provide technical assistance. So if they had a telehealth platform, um, they didn't have the capacity to provide technical assistance to their patients um, or, or others who uh, wanted to use that platform and were having trouble with technology. Um, 
the other main barriers that were pointed out, uh, technology was number one, um, trying to understand what platform to use, um, what platforms are HIPAA compliant, things like that. Um, payment was the second largest barrier and payment included um, just understanding payment policy, um, reimbursement, uh, things like that. Uh, workforce, uh, having the, the workforce capacity was the third largest barrier. And then fourth was bandwidth in rural areas. And go to the next slide. Um, so one of the largest things we've done is uh, do this uh, virtual conference. Um, this conference was supposed to be in Portland and had to be uh, quickly changed to a virtual conference. And uh, the speakers as well had to respond. And we've made, uh, we've had a lot of submissions changed to specifically um, talk about COVID-19 and how telehealth can be used uh, for this pandemic. Um, I wanna just point out a couple of the presentations that um, We'll focus on telehealth and starting a telehealth program, our telehealth 101 workshop um, that's today. We have a, a telehealth policy panel that's gonna be excellent. And another uh, presentation on how to start a telebehavioral health service, which I think will be uh, really important for people who are um, looking to do behavioral health uh, through telehealth and how to get started. Um, can we do the next slide? Um, so another thing we've done in terms of responding to COVID-19 on our NRTRC website, we've created a, a new page specifically for um, COVID-19. We've got a, a telehealth toolkit for providers and a lot of uh, information that we're trying to keep up to date on state laws and reimbursement policies, um, CMS updates, HIPAA, SAMHSA, DEA updates. Uh, the changes are coming out so fast, it's, it's hard to keep anything up to date, uh, but we're, we're doing our best to, and, and those updates can be found on the NRTRC website. Um, next slide. Uh, we're also holding weekly office hours. So every Friday um, at two to three o'clock mountain time, uh, we're doing a, a Zoom meeting and allowing people to join in and ask any questions they have about starting a telehealth program, about um, policy or reimbursement changes, Medicare, Medicaid, and so far th those have been great. The first one we had over 50 people on uh, with a lot of questions. Um, we also have this uh, telehealth quick start guide that I mentioned for providers where we try to cover all these different um, aspects of starting a telehealth program and what some of the challenges might be um, to help people get started. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I just want to thank everybody again for joining. Uh, this is a very exciting um, event. Um, Deb LaMarche, uh, her contact information is, is there. Deb has been leading the NRTRC. She's the, the PI and program director um, and is just full of knowledge and, and resources. Um, so please reach out to Deb or myself um, if we can be of assistance in any way. Thank you very much. Thank you again to all of the presenters and uh, uh, especially to you, uh, Mr. McCulloch, for, uh, for your, your comments and remarks there. We have now come to the Q&A portion for the State of the Region panel. Uh, as advised earlier, please enter your questions into the chat box and please indicate if the question is for a specific panelist. I'm sorry, not in the chat box. We have a Q&A uh, available in your toolbar at the bottom. 
Q&A icon. If you hover over the bottom toolbar, you can click on that and then enter questions um, for the panelists there. Sorry, Elia. Thank you so much for the clarification. Okay, uh, as you all are filling in questions into the, the Q&A box, uh, let me uh, ask, ask the question to attendees uh, in the meantime. Uh, to those of you who have performed assessments, uh, telehealth assessments for your program, what recommendations uh, or lessons learned can you, uh, can you provide when fir first embarking into one of these assessments for, for those who may be interested in, in doing one in their region, state, or within their, their uh, 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 clinical practice? Thanks, Alia. So this is Tammy. And I think that the first thing that we always um, encourage our sites to do is address what problem they're trying to solve. So access for access sakes doesn't really mean anything, but if there's something within the community or the facility that needs to be addressed and can uh, be solved through a telemedicine program, then um, that is key to getting started, right? And then I think that also, if you're doing an assessment of need, you can also then look at what potentially uh, could be added onto a telemedicine program um, as you're going forward. We always highly recommend that uh, folks look at workflow. Uh, your telemedicine program should complement the work and the processes that are already occurring within the facility and not be an add-on or be something separate. So for, we spend a lot of time dealing with workflow to make sure that um, it's a seamless process for the staff who are providing the services. And then, of course, reimbursement is key. I think that in the needs assessment, that's one thing that you'll want to do is make sure that it's a reimbursable service, that uh, the service is appropriate for the staff and what you're offering. And then in terms of technology, uh, I, I laugh because I have, I have lots of years of technology experience. And part of me says it, it's smart to have an appliance, uh, something that is not as variable in terms of networks and updates and uh, the internet like a computer with a web camera. And then other parts of me realize that that's the least expensive way to go and that um, it certainly is something that can work and, and make sense for the provider end of it. But Above all else, and I think Matt has alluded to this, the support for the technology and for any kind of programming for not only the providers, but for the patients is really key into um, having a successful program. Thank you. Uh, do any other uh, panelists have anything to share on that question? So this is Rose from the Office of Rural Health and here in Oregon. My recommendation, I think that as I went through the two, uh, the repository, which really outlined and um, illustrated what services critical access hospitals are already doing. From an organizational standpoint, it would have been extremely helpful if we had created that resource before we um, created the, the assessment then we would have had a much better idea of what what all was already going on out there and could have shifted focus in potentially a different direction. However, to the point that Tammy made, all of the components, the finance and community and needs and access and all those pieces are absolutely critical. Thank you. Uh, we have some questions in the chat box, so I will go to those now. Uh, we have one. Um, the Alaska governor signed HB 29 into law this year, which requires group and individual insurance plans provided through the state to reimburse for telehealth. It does not specify specific professions under this law. Are any of you familiar with this new law, and could you speak to it if it is being implemented? It was signed into law on March 16th, and became effective on March 17th. Can any of our panelists speak to this question? So, 
So this is Tammy again, and um, I think that especially in light of COVID and the kinds of um, services that are being implemented and approved, it, it's not going to, again, part of, it, part of the issue is, can we have telehealth services and do we have any kind of payment for it? The answer is yes, but does that include every profession in the medical profession? Uh, no, right? It, it often uh, requires um, additional statement, uh, but it certainly means in terms of CMS, the kinds of providers that are already approved. And I'm not familiar with the law, um, so I'm not able to speak uh, to it specifically. Um, but if you, we, we will take all of these questions and they will be posted uh, back to the NRTRC, where we will definitely get answers for you and find a way uh, after the conference to get them posted as well. And then Ali, if you don't mind, I'm, I have the Q&A open. I also see that um, Jack Davies, who I know, hello Jack, um, asked the question to clarify in the new Washington telehealth payment parity law, does that only apply to state-based programs like Medicaid and private payers, or does it apply to Medicare as well? And if it does not apply to Medicare, is there a compar comparable federal law? I'm not sure about a comparable f federal law, but it is basically a Medicaid and private insurers within the state of Washington. As we know, Medicare has uh, provided a lot of leniency during COVID, and I'm hoping that um, by the time we're through with this, the silver lining is, is that uh, the rules and regulations of Medicare will open up significantly. And I appreciate the uh, question, Jack, thanks. Thank you, Ms. Arndt. Uh, we have uh, another question. Uh, hello, and thank you for your presentation. Many of your organizations have set up telehealth in an orderly way with a relatively long prep time. For those of us creating de novo telehealth programs in this time of urgency, what sort of pitfalls should we watch for if we don't have time to complete a true needs assessment, et cetera? Is there any panelists that would like to field this one? So this is Tammy again. Sorry, I feel like I'm just <laughs> taking all of these. Uh, so if it, if it was me, right, and you're like, okay, we have to do something now, what is the quickest way we can do it? Of course, the all the software that's out there in the world, um, Zoom, for example, right, that people are using for direct to patient or between clinics or between providers, um, there's certainly reasonable and useful tools but I want to be, there's the cautionary tale of how you set up a, a license, a software license. And so in setting up that software license, we need to make sure that um, we have ability to lock conferences or we set up waiting rooms. So having some technical knowledge of how to set up a HIPAA compliant software so that you can deliver services is the quickest way that people can use tools that they already have like computers with cameras and microphones uh, to make sure that we stay connected during this time. This is Matt. I might just add to that too. You know, often when people are starting up a program, the first thing they think of is technology. And I think I used to do that as well. And one of the things I've learned is that there are so many other aspects that are, are just as important. Um, I, I really look forward to the telehealth 101 workshop to later today because it's covering these other aspects like um, reimbursement um, and also clinical workflow. I think clinical workflow, even if you don't have, a, have time to put a large policy in place, being able to think through your, your current clinical workflow and when a patient comes in, um, signing consent forms um, and being in a waiting room, uh, maybe seeing a nurse first, that, that workflow is so important. Um, so I just want to stress that the focus isn't just on technology, but on the other aspects of a, a clinical program that, that make it successful. Thank you so much for your comments. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, as Ms. Art indicated that we'll be sharing the questions that we cannot get through in the session uh, with NRTRC uh, to be able to get responses to them. Uh, 
how can we how can we help patients and families without the technology or internet access get what they need to participate in telehealth from their home? Have you collected strategies for how to do this? This is Rose from the Oregon Office of Rural Health. This is actually the next webinar in a, in a series that um, our office is going to host with. We have a couple of organizations uh, in our state who are specifically in charge of assistive technology devices, as well as programs that help folks access um, phones and, and broadband and things like that. So I would encourage individuals to reach out to organizations within their state, because in some states there are, are mandated organizations that do provide these sorts of services and outreach. I'll just mention a few other um, conversations that are going on right now. Um, we're really involved in um, projects that the FCC is doing with uh, broadband access um, and also um, tapping into um, education and other public um, resources. There's been a lot of talk about um, assisting um, uh, tribal communities and, uh, you know, allowing um, schools uh, and libraries to keep their internet access open to the public. So if somebody doesn't have internet access at home, they could possibly pull up in the parking lot at the, at the public library and get access to internet. Um, and I think that goes hand in hand with some of the relaxed uh, regulations on using HIPAA compliant uh, platforms, um, you know, using using a phone, using FaceTime, um, being able to communicate with a provider that way, um, especially during this pandemic, you know, a lot of these relaxed regulations are for that purpose for these individuals that don't have access in their home or, or have a, a good enough bandwidth. So there is a lot happening, even telecommunications companies, um, there's discussion about how they can open up their networks um, to allow people to connect, uh, dur especially during the pandemic. But there, a lot of it right now is, is discussions. Um, there's still a lot that needs to happen to make it formal, but those discussions are happening. Thank you so much, Ms. McCulloch. Uh, that's all the time that we have for questions now. Uh, we will now move to our uh, HHS Region 10 Telehealth Resources and Program Updates, where we will hear from HHS Regional Administrators in Region 10. We are first joined by Regional Administrator Kimberly Miyazawa Frank from the Administration for Children and Families. Kimberly Miyazawa Frank is the Regional Administrator of Region 10, Administration for Children and Families, supporting Alaska, Idaho, Oregon, Washington, and 272 tribal nations. Focused on the national priorities of prevention and economic mobility, she leads the Seattle team and with program leadership, executes cross-program strategies to enhance state's human service supports. With a leadership approach reflecting the aloha spirit, she has committed her career to improving outcomes for families via human capital, organizational, and community development. Previous leadership roles have been with the Aspen Institute, Hawaii Department of Human Services, Hulama Lani, and as CEO of the YWCA of Oahu. Miyazawa Frank has led a business consultancy and worked with the Gallup Organization and Towers Perrin. She is a former litigation attorney and served on the boards of local and national nonprofits. She holds a Bachelor of Science from Miami University and a, J and a JD from Rutgers School of Law. Regional Administrator Miyazawa Frank, the floor is yours. Thank you, Aliyah, and good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here. I want to thank um, HRSA and the RA, Sharon Turner, 
as well as Aaliyah for her help in uh, organizing and pulling together this panel. I also want to thank NRTRC for their uh, sponsor sponsorship and support. Um, so ACF is the human services arm of the Department of Health and Human Services. So in that role, we partner with our colleagues at HRSA, CMS, SAMHSA, and ACL to address uh, the social determinants of health. And today I'd like to talk about the accessibility of social services and supports in Region 10. Just as quick background, ACF is the second largest agency within HHS. We administer over 60 programs with a total annual budget of over $53 million. Our Seattle office is comprised of staff that represents uh, the ACF Office of Child Care, Child Support Enforcement, Child Welfare, Head Start, uh, TANF or Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, Refugee Resettlement, and runaway and homeless youth programs, among others. Next slide, please, Aaliyah. Today, I'll share just a few slides uh, with updates on one, how ACF programs are providing online and telephonic access to social services, two, our reach in rural communities, and three, if we have time, some promising innovations at the state level that we hope will continue to strengthen access for rural communities as well as for all families in Region 10. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, ACF was focused on shifting the way we deliver human services to take a whole family approach that really put families at the center of our work and find new ways to provide accessible um, services. In light of the emergency, however, the urgency of this work has increased and ACF has consequently provided new guidance and continues to do so um, guidance to grantees on flexibilities in how we provide services uh, in light of the social distancing and other uh, orders that have been administered by states. So as we shift our typical modes of operation to meet these challenges, I believe we will set into motion a new and more accessible way of reaching families and communities. There's so much innovation taking place as we speak um, I'm on calls regularly with states who are rising to the challenge of unprecedented 20-fold increases in applications for benefits, and our grantees work to meet the pressing economic and social needs of families who have lost income, child care supports, employment, social connection, and in some cases, even loved ones. Next slide, please. Uh, while many remote casework and telehealth activities can be done over the telephone, some may require access to the internet. And so the internet may be a factor in, ex in accessing critical benefits to supporting families uh, who are dealing with economic consequences in response to the pandemic. So it's, for us, it's important to consider that people in poverty are less likely to have access to the internet. What we know is that nationally, more than one in six people who live in poverty have no internet access. This is even more pronounced in non-metropolitan areas where people in poverty are eight percentage points less likely to have access to the internet than people uh, in poverty who live in metropolitan areas. Limitations in internet access are also more pronounced for people over the age of 65. Fewer than two thirds of the people over age 65 who live in poverty have access to the internet in their homes. And finally, although Region 10 is actually doing better than many other parts of the country in res with respect to access um, to the internet, in 2018 in Washington, Oregon, and Idaho, between 15, or excuse me, between 10 to 15 percent of low income people had no access to internet in their homes. In Alaska, between 15 and 18% of low-income people had access to internet in their homes in 2018. Next slide, please. While I don't have time to go into depth on each of our programs, I did wanna share two examples of new program guidance that has come out in response to the COVID-19 pandemic that will change the way that ACF services are delivered and make them more accessible. Uh, the first is our Office of Family Assistance, with, which administers the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, or TANF, um, issued guidance uh, 
in March that encourages, among other things, the use of existing flexibility in TANF to assess eligibility for cash assistance or other benefits online or by telephone in order to reduce face-to-face -face interaction. Um, it also encourages states to make training, job search, and work readiness activities, all that, those are all requirements, make those available online and do case management virtually as well. The second example is from our Children's Bureau, which administers the child welfare welfare programs. Uh, throughout the course of the pandemic, they have sent letters to state child welfare leaders and even to the courts um, and, and uh, leadership of the judicial system, encouraging the use of video conferencing to ensure the continuity of monthly caseworker visits, um, parental visits, and check-ins via telephone or other methods with foster youth uh, in college campuses to ensure that they had housing and other supports they needed while many campuses closed down. As a result of this, many students have been able to stay in the dorms uh, even when other students were required to leave campus. Next slide, please. ACF's uh, Office of Head Start has also provided new COVID-19 guidance to grantees, encouraging them to follow public health authorities and close down center operations where appropriate, while ensuring that staff continue to provide virtual family engagement and child development supports for vulnerable families. Programs are innovating as we speak. Teachers are sending videos to families so children can listen to their daily story time, and family support specialists are calling by phone to coach families and make referrals to services where needed. All of this would have taken place in person prior to the pandemic. The Head Start program is also receiving funding in the CARES Act to provide summer programming and ensure that children are ready to transition to kindergarten. So our team is working with grantees over the coming weeks and months uh, to establish new modes of, of uh, reaching families. And this map, um, I love that we love maps on this webinar. I included on this slide maps of the locations of our early Head Start and Head Start programs in both Oregon and Idaho to give you a sense of the reach in rural communities across the four states in Region 10. You can see here that we have programs in some of the most rural communities in Eastern Oregon and in Northern and Southern Idaho. These programs are a critical resource in these communities providing comprehensive services and supports for families. And over the coming weeks and months, we will continue to learn a lot about Head Start programs, how they can, even when they're closed for normal operations, continue to ensure that we have um, uh, eyes on kids and that kids have access to the resources they need, whether those be social, educational, or health services. Next slide, please. Finally, in addition to these updates on how ACF or the federal government is working to make social services more accessible to families, I wanted to share two promising examples of how states are also innovating, and I love the state examples earlier. Um, from our perspective in Idaho, uh, importantly for those living in rural communities, the changes in their eligibility and enrollment system um, have made it possible for families and individuals to apply for benefits online or by phone without driving miles to offices to apply in person with paper application. That is a huge shift and they've been working on that for a while, just in time for this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And in Washington, I was recently able to participate in a meeting where I learned that uh, they are applying um, some incredibly innovative strategies to how the state is responding to increase their telephone capacity for benefit applications and eligibility determinations. Um, literally shifting staff from one uh, division or one office to another, training them up and having them uh, staff these call centers um, and move from in-person eligibility offices um, to uh, virtual um, supports. So we have so much that we can learn from states and so much that states are doing uh, in response to the current need as well as to plan for the surge of applications and needs that we anticipate in the com coming months. And uh, 
I was delighted to share some of these um, with you and look forward to being able to track uh, what else is going on in our region to benefit uh, families and individuals in our rural communities. Thank you so much. And with the next slide, I just share some contact information for you. Thanks so much and be well, everyone. Thank you, Regional Administrator Miyazawa Frank for those updates. Next, we will hear from Regional Administrator Rochelle Zilstra from the Administration for Community Living. Uh, Rochelle Shelley Zilstra, a relative newcomer to federal service, has worked in government programs which serve older adults and people with disabilities for nearly 40 years. Currently the Regional Administrator for the Administration for Community Living, she was trained in the sciences with degrees in nutrition, chemistry, medical science, and environmental biochemistry, and completed her PhD in geriatric nutrition in 1995. In her career, she has developed programs and systems which serve community members with innovation, cost effectiveness, and excellent outcomes. Shelley has strong relationships with tribal communities and has worked closely with many to develop programs to serve their people. Regional Administrator Zilstra, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Ali. I appreciate that. Uh, just wanted to thank Kimberly as well for her presentation and kind of uh, appropriate for us to follow ACF. Uh, the Administration for Community Living offers a number of programs, uh, primarily social service programs. Likely the most common ones that you may be familiar with, <clears throat> excuse me, would be Meals on Wheels. Also some of the senior transportation vans that run around uh, are also something that is commonly identified as uh, funded through the programs that we operate. I, uh, I want, one of the hallmarks of the Older Americans Act, which is our authorizing legisl legislation, is two things. Number one is local control. Services are not the same regardless of where you go. You will find home delivered meals everywhere, but they may be delivered by the Navy. And so then you have a Meals on Keels program. And, and there's just a variety of ways which local communities have adapted to providing services uh, in their communities. I, I'd like to point out that some of the services that we offer are, uh, are not direct health care services. Uh, we, do, we have a large case management program where individuals who, frankly, are not means tested, uh, older adults in particular, can fall apart regardless of whether they have a lot of money in the bank or no money in the bank. And our programs help to fill that gap. I think it's it's pretty critical to identify the fact that uh, in the rural locations, using telephonic methods to do case management uh, is something that has been done for years. Uh, and in the time of COVID, of course, everything has become virtual. One thing that I have identified in working in telehealth uh, and with telehealth programs is the focus is, it tends to be primarily on the clinic, the hospital, and on medical providers. And often this uh, equipment goes unused uh, over weekends unless it's an emergency or during evening times. And I uh, would encourage people that are establishing these systems to, to loop in uh, senior service programs, uh, skilled nursing facilities, uh, senior centers, other places where health and well-being uh, is supported. I had a, uh, I recognize that when older adults are taken from their environment and taken to a clinic for an assessment, often the change in environment causes catastrophic reactions, particularly those with either mental health and or um, uh, dementing illness issues, and those catastrophic reactions can really uh, eliminate the possibility of a clinician to do a good assessment. So um, I wanted to, uh, to let you know that uh, th these are programs and places to think about placing facilities or placing equipment and program uh, information and offering these services through a sort of allied health uh, areas. I had uh, a privilege of being in Alaska at one point uh, visiting a skilled nursing facility and um, 
while I was there, there was an elder. Uh, of course, in in Alaska, often the 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 distance between villages is phenomenally large, and I uh, was quite impressed to see that uh, they had a telehealth program in this particular skilled nursing facility. It was actually an assisted living facility. There was an elder there who had been moved from the village uh, to a great distance and uh, was far away from their family and was not thriving because of the social isolation. And they were uh, set, they had set, used the telehealth uh, program to set up a visitation with his family in a village next door. And the elder was taken into uh, the room to go and visit with family on a large screen TV. And the response from that elder was something that changed my heart. Uh, It made me appreciate the value of the technology. Uh, The elder was responding in a way that it was Uh, it was as if his family were in that room and even his demeanor as he left the room was uh, changed. And so we know uh, Kimberly addressed social determinants of health. Uh, We know that social isolation for older adults uh, and with people with disabilities can be catastrophic. And I think uh, I, I just would encourage folks to think about alternative utilizations of these services as as their designing systems and viewing what community needs are. Uh, the ability of a skilled nursing facility in a rural location to have access uh, to a physician uh, via telehealth uh, is tremendous. And so I would encourage you to think along those lines. So I thank you for your time today. I uh, look forward to any questions that you might have and I'll turn it back to Aliyah. Thank you so much, Regional Administrator Zilstra, for those updates. We will now hear from Regional Administrator Daryl Means from the Centers for Medicare, Medicare and Medicaid Services. Mr. Means is the Northwest Regional Administrator at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. He is the Executive Leader responsible for overseeing Medicare and Medicaid programs, agency initiatives, business partnership and development, and outreach and education throughout the region. Mr. Means' background includes a distinguished leadership career in the United States Air Force, as well as leadership positions in the private health insurance and technology sectors. Mr. Means joined CMS in 2009. He's earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in Technology Management from St. Leo University, a Master's degree in Health Administration, and a Graduate Certificate in Organizational Leadership from Chapman University. Regional Administrator Means, the floor is yours. Thank you, Aaliyah. And good morning, everyone. Um, I don't think there's any press on the line, but I, I do need to say if there is press on there and have questions for CMS, you need to reach out to the press office. Uh, first and foremost, let me thank everyone for all of your hard work and dedication to ensure Medicare and Medicaid uh, beneficiaries receive the best care possible. I sincerely, I, I really do appreciate all that you do. And I'm encouraged from what I'm hearing in this forum. I've heard things from uh, Mary, such as Idaho is leading the way, and Rose talks about quality, availability, accessibility. And I think uh, Tammy said the corner of help and happy. And then obviously Matt, you know, I I too like to see the maps, although I don't have any today. but, but I'm very appreciative of everything that's being done around this uh, COVID epidemic. Uh, today, I will briefly discuss the COVID blanket waivers that we have put in place, but only at a general manage, uh, manner because of time. Uh, but before I begin, I will let you know that CMS has set up a mailbox specifically for COVID-19 questions, and that mailbox is COVID, C-O-V-I-D, hyphen, 19, at cms.hhs.gov. And I I encourage you that if your questions are not answered on, uh, in this forum, to use that uh, address, uh, COVID-19, at cms.hhs.gov. And we'll definitely get back uh, to you. We we surely want to hear what you do 
I guess we, we really want to help you, but we want to hear what you have to say. And this helps us trend as well. So if we need to make any changes or uh, provide additional support from uh, CMS, this helps us a lot. Next slide, Aaliyah. Now I'm not going to go into uh, you know what a uh, 1135 is. I think everyone knows what an 1135 is. However, I, I do want to say that the goal of our blanket waiver was fivefold. Uh, one, we wanted to ensure uh, you could increase your capacity to handle any potential uh, surge from the COVID-19 uh, virus as patients came through hospitals. And, and we also wanted to make sure that uh, you could exercise uh, hospitals without walls, which is an expansion outside of your existing facility. Uh, we, we wanted to improve staffing flexibility by reducing some of the regulatory requirements and facilitate, facilitating the ability to bring in resources from other states where needed. Um, and we also wanted to increase access to telehealth, which we're all talking about here today to help mitigate the spread of COVID-19 and to uh, reduce infections in not only uh, individuals, but also in providers and staffs at hospitals and other facilities. Um, the fourth thing we wanted to achieve here was to allow more testing at home or in the community-based settings, such as what you see with the drive-up uh, testing sites. And then the last thing here is definitely we want to put patients before paperwork so that you can focus on providing the proper care to our Medicare and, and Medicaid beneficiaries. Next slide, Aaliyah, please. One of the things we wish to make clear in this slide is that the 1135 process waives federal requirements, oh, excuse me, only, uh, not state requirements, uh, reimbursements for uh, authorizations outside of many of the normal regulatory requirements are permitted and the blanket waivers are only good as long as the emergency exists. As a reminder, you know, questions regarding state requirements should be addressed by the appropriate state office. Next slide, Leah. Okay, here we're, we're just, this is just a slide about uh, Medicare blanket waivers and some of the things that uh, you can expect to see. But uh, the key here is that once the waiver is approved, um, as long as it's covered by the waiver, you don't have to, to come into um, CMS for anything else. But you can see here that we address two types of waiver, blanket waiver an individual waiver. Blanket waivers are what we are talking about now because of the emergency and pandemic. And um, if, if something is not covered under the blanket waiver, then you would have to submit a 1135 request uh, when the blanket waiver does not cover your need. But blanket waivers apply to all providers. Uh, what we ask during the blanket waivers is that it's not mandatory that you do this, you have to look at your own needs and, and uh, should you need to use the waiver, um, please do, that's what it's there for. Next slide. This slide shows some of the flexibilities uh, that are covered under the blanket waivers. As you can see, there, there's a lot covered and, and there's more detail and information than we can cover in this uh, forum during the time allotted but I do encourage all of you to uh, check out our CMS website. And when you get on cms.gov, you'll see the, uh, the picture of the molecule of uh, a virus there. And if you click on the learn button, learn more button, it'll take you to more information that will explain in detail a lot of uh, what is covered here under this uh, waiver, or these waivers, I should say. Next slide. Next slide, Aaliyah. Oh, I'm sorry, you did. No, you go back, I'm sorry. Thank you. And, and this slide, we just wanted to talk about, you know, states and 
territories and Medicaid just briefly. Uh, CMS believes that states have the flexibility for prior auth and to provide extended supplies and early refills. Uh, these questions have been asked a lot to us, so I just wanted to include this slide. Um, they don't need CMS approval for this. Uh, we encourage states to fully incorporate telemedicine, as we call it on the Medicaid side, but uh, you know, telemedicine technology, which is the same as telehealth, if you will. Uh, you, you should check with your state Medicaid office if you have uh, more information or need more information on what's authorized by the state. Uh, under managed care, a contract amendment for prior auth for early refills and, and uh, extended day supplies depend on the managed care contract. So uh, if it is not allowed, a contract amendment will be necessary. So if, if you need more information from CMS on this, uh, I recommend that you go to medicaid.gov and at the top of the page, you'll see a little banner that says resources for states and that will help you out there. Next slide. We already talked a little bit about this, so you, you don't have to make a request for an accommodation if it's already covered under a blanket waiver. Um, and you do not need to notify CMS if you're taking any action based on that waiver. Uh, but again, as I said, if it is not covered under the waiver, you will need to uh, request a waiver via the 1135 process, and you should send that request to 1135waivers at cms.hhs.gov. Next slide, please. CMS issues blanket waivers to reduce burdens and enable flexibility as, you know, the needs re require. Once again, we encourage all of you to get the latest updates from the website at cms.gov. Uh, if you click on that learn more button, uh, it, it will give you a little bit more information and you can go to our frequently asked questions and other guidance that you may need. Next slide. Here's a quick overview of expectations. The key here is keeping good records um, in a contingency and understanding the waivers uh, are not the norm and you will need to return to being compliant after the emergency is over. Uh, but we do ask that you keep records just in case there's any billing concerns or whatever, you have that information uh, available. Next slide, please. This is a little bit on billing and billing modifiers. I don't want to get into a lot of details here. As all of you know, um, there's a lot of information when it comes to HCPCS and, and uh, other billing codes and uh, things like that. But uh, this is just a reminder that you should use the DR condition code and the CR modifier appropriately for claims associated with blanket waivers. And again, for more information on this, uh, you should consult CMS Medicare Learning Network or what we call MLN Matters. Um, and the file number for that is MM6451. Next slide, please. We've already talked a little bit about this uh, as far as questions and things like that and contact information. Um, just a couple of things that I just wanna share here for you. I'll leave this slide up just a second if you wanna write some information down. Um, but pretty much there's different ways that you can contact us. In the beginning, I did say use the COVID-19 mailbox and I, I, I really do encourage that. However, um, we've already talked about 1135 waivers. Um, this process has al already been established that you could use the 1135 waiver mailbox but I, I do want to say that we are available as well in the Seattle office, as you know, and you can contact us at that number or that email box if you have any questions for us. Um, and then also if there's billing issues, we, we do recommend that you contact, uh, contact the Mac. Uh, the last slide. That completes my presentation. And again, I know this was very quick and high level, we're here to support any questions that you may have. Just give us 
uh, a call in the office and or use the, uh, the mailboxes that we had in this uh, presentation. But again, I, I, I wanna say that I thank all of you for all of the hard work that you, you're doing. I know it's endless, but uh, we are making a difference collectively and I just ask that you all be safe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Regional Administrator Means, for those updates. Next, we will receive updates from Regional Administrator Sharon Turner from the Health Resources and Services Administration. Sharon Turner has a passion for serving vulnerable and underserved populations and has over 30 years experience in public health and human services. Ms. Turner has been with the Health Resources and Services Administration since 2004 and currently serves as the Regional Administrator for Region 10, covering the states of Alaska, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington. She is responsible for providing oversight to HRSA's Office of Regional Operations, which primarily works to provide on-the-ground outreach to increase the reach, impact, and awareness of HRSA programs. In addition to her experience with HRSA, Ms. Turner has worked with Kansas City's leading universities and hospitals, such as the University of Kansas, the University of Missouri, Kansas City, Children's Mercy Hospital, and Truman Medical Center. She is a social worker and has obtained dual master's degrees in social work from the University of Missouri, Kansas City, and master's in public administration from Park University. Regional Administrator Turner, the floor is yours. Thank you, Aaliyah. Um, for the sake of time, um, I will go through and, and get to the, the real content of, of what we're doing in HRSA regarding telehealth. Um, so Aaliyah, if you could take me to the next slide. Okay. I'm sorry, I wasn't able to hear you, Sharon. If you could take uh, one slide back. There we go. So um, HRSA, many of you know, um, we're one of the Department of Health and Human Services operating divisions. We're um, 11 out of the, one of the 11 operating divisions out of HHS. Um, we support more than 90 programs through grants and cooperative agreements. Um, to more than 3,000 awardees, including community and faith-based organizations, um, colleges and universities, as well as hospital, state, local, and tribal governments, and private entities. Um, every year, we provide um, services to tens of millions of people, including people living with HIV AIDS, um, pregnant women, mothers, and their children. Um, and those who otherwise are unable to access quality health care. Next slide. Okay, so here you see a map and it's um, showing the 10 uh, regional offices within HHS, as well as within um, each of those offices, HRSA is located in the Office of Regional Operations. Um, our primary mission is to improve health equity in underserved communities through on the ground outreach, education and technical assistance and partnering with local, state and federal organizations. Um, this panel today is an example of the type of work and the type of partnering that we do uh, within our regions. Um, next slide, Aaliyah. So within HRSA, we have the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy, and it serves as a focal point um, within HRSA and the Department of Health and Human Services for our rural health related issues, and as the principal source of advisement to the Secretary for coordinating efforts to strengthen and improve the health delivery of services and populations in, in the rural area. Fourth, administers grant programs designed to build healthcare capacity at both the community and state levels and advance the use of telehealth and coordination of health information and technology. And within FORP, um, we have the Office for the Advancement of Telehealth, and we often refer to that as OAT. And OAT promotes the use of telehealth technologies um, for healthcare delivery, education, and health information services. 
Um, telehealth is especially critical in rural health and other remote areas that lack sufficient health care services. Next slide, please. So this slide identifies um, HRSA's commitment as well as uh, uh, HHS commitment um, to telehealth. And you will see that in fiscal year 18, HRSA had over 1,000 awards with telehealth, uh, the, the telehealth component. Um, that's a 36% increase um, from fiscal year 17. And I also want to note that these awards uh, covered all 50 states and, ter and eight territories. Um, and then you will see over to your left, to my right, um, is a pie chart. And you will see the different bureaus and offices that have uh, telehealth awards and programs within them. And at this point, you will see that um, the Bureau of Primary Health Care through our uh, community health centers um, lead with 956 awards, um, followed by the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy with 139 awards um, for telehealth. Next slide, Aaliyah. So this slide indicates the type or the scope of uh, telehealth services um, within the awards. And you will see that um, the majority of the awards, 159, utilize telehealth functions in direct clinical services. And 104 awards use telehealth functions to provide clinical support. Um, I also want to emphasize that there was uh, a use of 96 um, awards for telehealth functions for distance learning, um, separate from the Project ECHO. Um, so um, that's something that uh, I think is really noteworthy about the scope and, and the um, depth of telehealth resources available. Next slide. Here we can see that in fiscal year 19, telehealth-related um, funding um, by the state I'm sorry, provided by the Office of, for the Advancement of Telehealth. Um, some of the highlights are that the Telehealth Network Grant Program uh, awarded 21 awards, totaling um, a little over $7 million. And then the Evidence-Based Telebehavioral Health Network uh, was awarded 14 awards, um, equaling about $4 million. Uh, one of the programs that is that I really want to note is that the telehealth resource centers, as our, our, our panelist uh, Michael um, highlighted earlier, um, with an award of 14 awards across the, the nation with over $4 million. Next slide. And as we've been talking um, about um, HHS and HRSA's response to COVID-19 for our rural grantees, um, there is, through the um, Federal Office of Rural Health Policy, uh, we received $180 million in the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic um, Security, or better re references CARES Act, um, to support COVID-19-related activities, of which $150 million will go to hospitals um, responding to this health crisis. Um, the funds will support the hospitals, um, which are seeing increased demands for clinical service and equipment, as well as experiencing short-term financial and workforce challenges related to the response. Um, the funding will be awarded to states throughout the Small Rural uh, Hospital Improvement Program, our reference is SHIP, grant mechanism, and uh, eligibility will be for small rural hospitals that are non-federal short-term general acute care facilities that are located in the rural area uh, of the U.S. and territories, including the faith-based hospitals. Um, I also would like to bring your attention to a few rural health-related funding opportunities. Um, Ali, if you would go to the next thing to the next slide. So. Um, here you will find um, the announcements and updates and resources 
related to um, COVID-19. Um, it is, um, if you go to the hrsa.gov slash uh, coronavirus, and then also for technical questions related to um, rural health in the response to coronavirus or COVID-19, um, there's a frequently asked questions um, session section for our um, rural health grantees. And then we also have the Center for Connected rural, uh, Health Policy as also a resource for you. Next slide. Oh, I believe that is it. Um, again, I want to just thank you all for, for participating in today's panel and in this presentation. Um, the timeliness of this um, is, is very critical for us and it shows the great resources and strength and, and just the partnership that we have here in Region 10. So again, thank you. And I will turn it over to Aaliyah. Thank you, Regional Administrator Turner, for those updates and resources. Uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, our Regional Administrator David Dickinson um, is, because of the scheduling conflict, is, is unable to present. Uh, we have his slide deck posted on the uh, NRTRC session website. So you'll be able to uh, download his slides from that lo location. He was going to highlight uh, available learning series. Um, uh, some upcoming learning consultations and Center of Excellence for Protected Health Information. Uh, these slides will be available on the site for, for your download and uh, review later. Uh, thank you again to all of the presenters that we had today. Uh, we have now come to the Q&A portion of the HHS Region 10 Telehealth Resources and Program Updates. We have gone over slightly. I think we can maybe allot five minutes for questions before we, we, we must wrap up. Um, as advised earlier, please enter your questions into the Q&A uh, box, and please indicate if the question is for a specific panelist. We have one question currently in the chat box. Um, will we be covering if Medicaid uh, is covering the periodic exam slash well child examinations by telemedicine? And what are the best practices for these exams? Thank you. I believe this may be uh, to you, regional administrator, means if the if Medicaid is covering the periodic exams, well child examinations by telemedicine. And Leah, um, I believe um, Regional Administrator Means had to leave and um, he encouraged if there were any questions related to his presentation that to follow up with him directly and he will respond. Okay, thank you so much Regional Administrator Turner. Uh, we will take this question um, and if you would like to direct it to the emails that he provided during uh, his session. Um, that would be the most direct uh, way to get resolution. Uh, we don't have any existing questions in the Q&A queue, so I'd like to just put one question to our uh, to our panelists. Um, uh, what is the best way for stakeholders to stay engaged or up to date on the resources released by your office, and uh, especially uh, with uh, how can they stay up to date with the uh, COVID-19 related telehealth and rural health updates. Uh, to any panelist that uh, is, is ready to respond. I'll mention a few resources really quickly. Um, as I mentioned when I was speaking earlier, I would definitely encourage people to contact their telehealth resource center. All of the resource centers are doing their best to um, 
compile a lot of the updates and changes that are happening and post them on their websites. Another really great resource, um, which is tied to that, is the Center for Connected Health Policy website. They do an incredible job at keeping up to date on Medicare and Medicaid changes um, and specifically by state. So if you are in a particular state and have questions um, that you can't find through another source, I would recommend the Center for Connected Health Policy. Thank you so much. Do any other Thank panelists? Um, I was going to say, I believe you have a listing of all of the HHS um, contacts for program updates and resources as well. And we can um, share that collectively as one um, resource page. And then also I want to note that our HHS Regional Director, uh, John R. Graham, has a listserv for uh, HHS updates that goes out on a regularly basis that we can um, add any interested participants to. And also um, during uh, that listserv, the Regional Director provide COVID-19 updates as well. Thank you so much. In closing, I'd like to say thank you to all the speakers today for sharing this incredibly valuable information. Thank you to the attendees for your questions. Uh, we hope that we can continue sharing and learning on this important topic. You can learn more about HRSA at the uh, hrsa.gov website and sign up for the HRSA e-news or follow us via one of the listed platforms below. Um, we would uh, appreciate you filling out a session evaluation to, to give us feedback on the session today and for future sessions. Uh, please visit the above link uh, so that we can receive, receive your feedback for the session. It is on the uh, PowerPoint uh, slide from HRSA and also listed on the session website. Uh, next in the conference schedule is the valuable Telehealth 101 training, which will give a comprehensive overview to telehealth and, and starting your own telehealth program. This session will be starting at 1 p.m. today. Uh, and thank you again to all the speakers, all the attendees, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, Leah. Be well. Thank you, Leah. Thank you.